We are recording the interview of Terry Burkett. This interview is being conducted by Erica Carter and Katie Bradshaw from the Wright State University Veterans Voices Project. Also in attendance are Sharon Burkett. This interview is being recorded at Wright State University in the New Media Incubator. It is 11.33 a.m. on September 27, 2019. How are you, sir? I'm fine. Fine. Nervous, but I'm fine. Well, we don't <laughs> want you to be nervous. We'll start I know. off. I just, <laughs> hey, you just uh, get nervous when you. All of this? Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, we'll start off with some really easy questions. Oh, I good. Like I like easy questions. Okay, okay. <laughs> Where and when were you born? Uh, August 10th, 49, when I was born, and that was Danville, Illinois, at St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Danville. I was the second of five kids. Well, that was going to be my next question. I have uh, uh, four sisters. I have one passed away about four years ago. Uh, she had a diabetic, and she didn't. She was uh, fifty some years old, I think, but she she didn't take care of herself. So when I got three sisters, I got a half. I had a half sister. She passed away from cancer. I do have a half brother. He was in the in the military too, uh, Air Force, and he was over in Germany. So, but. Uh, Pretty good sized family. Okay. So, was your brother in at the same time you were? No, uh, he's 15 years older than I am, something like that. Oh. I think something like that. But he he lives in North, North Carolina, I think. So, but yeah. Did he ever share any of his experiences with you? No, he never did. He 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 got married, and we, I never got to talk to him much about it. So, but I communicate with him every once in a while. So that's nice. Uh, Okay, so who were your parents, and uh, what were their occupations? Parents were John Burkett. My dad used to be a forklift driver for Food Machinery Corporation in Hoopston, which was about uh, six miles, seven miles north of, of where we grew up. Uh, he did that for 27 and a half years, and then he retired, and he went back as a night watchman. Uh, he had a lot of friends up there, and that uh, he, I think that kind of made him... Uh, he didn't get to, he got to talk to him about what was going on and everything. My mom was always a stay-at-home mom. Uh, she uh, kept us to, together. Uh, when we went to school, uh, we'd go home, uh, eat lunch, we call it lunch, <laughs> and uh, she would cook for us and we'd go back to school. Uh, we started out in a two-bedroom house with five kids, and uh, then we moved into a bigger house that had, uh, uh, four bedrooms, and uh, so that was kind of nice. I got my own bedroom at that time, so that was kind of nice. <laughs> so, but, uh, and it's, uh, it's still, both of them are still up, and uh, people live in them. Oh. So, it, it was uh, quite a, a difference. Uh, when my dad bought that house, it was, uh, uh, he bought it for $7,500. And he told us, he said, you kids ain't going to be able to have any new clothes for two years. And that was just like a uh, mouth dropper, you know, like, <laughs> what do you mean we can't have any new <laughs> clothes? But it, it all worked out. I mean, I worked during, during, uh, during school. Uh, I bought a car. I worked uh, part-time on a farm. And that was uh, quite an experience to, to work out on the farm, plowing and disc, which you don't see a whole lot of plowing and discing anymore in the field. But that's what it was. And then you had to go out and... Uh, uh, you would have a hook, and uh, you would uh, cut them at the bottom of it and clean up the f where it wouldn't be as dirty looking like you see some of the fields now. They call it, which is, they call it dirty farming, which they don't go back and, and do it. But they farm rows a lot closer, so they you can't get in there and do that. So, but and pick up rocks. That was the worst job of all, <laughs> picking up rocks and then putting them in the uh, uh, tree lines. So. And that was quite an experience. And then I went to work for an IGA store, being uh, a sacker, and I had uh, uh, the, the soap aisle and everything, to, uh, which was pretty good. But then they, that burnt down while I was in the service, so I didn't have a job to go back to, which wouldn't have been a very good job <laughs> anyhow, but it burnt down while I was in the service. How so. old were you when you got your first job? First job, my dad had to drive me. And it was at a uh, carry, uh, um, car hop where you'd go out, people pull up, 
and you take down your order, and I was terrible at it. I think I made 30 some cents an hour, and I was seven miles away from home. My dad said, we can't afford to do this, so that was my first job. Second, uh, the, I guess my real job, uh, well, I mowed grass, and back then, a dollar <laughs> for mowing grass was quite a bit of money. <laughs> and then I went working out on the farm, and that, and that was good. That was uh, long hours. So. My mom picked potatoes when she was younger. Oh, yeah. And so that was a family event, like uh, you said. So grandma would be out there and, and all the rest of them. She was even, from what I was told, I, of course, wasn't there, uh, would have my um, uncle, who was uh, seven years younger than the other children, uh, with her. And they would just pick potatoes. And my mother said she didn't enjoy that either. So I can equate that to picking up rocks, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> I, and I think there was one time, I don't know how old I was when I did it, but they had, we had a factory in, in our little, little town that I grew up in it was only 1,500 people. And it was, you've always heard one light, one horse town. That's exactly where I grew up in. They had one light and then one horse on the very north east side of town. And that's why well, my grandmother lived right next to the farm, and that's where, we, that's where the small house was. But it was, it was, it was a good town. It was a lot, everybody, if I got in trouble on one side, they knew it before I got home. Oh my. What did you do, Terry? <laughs> I didn't do anything. <laughs> um, is that one of the reasons why you joined the service? Well, you know, and I tried to remember, I was trying to think about it after we talked. And I, I remember going down and talking to the Air Force recruiter about it. And then I thought, well, I hadn't signed anything yet, so it wasn't that I had to go do it. And uh, then uh, all of a sudden I got this uh, letter, your friends and neighbors have wanted you to join the Army. And I didn't want to go to the Army at that time, I wanted to go in the Air Force. My brother had been there. And so uh, uh, when that came about, I went back down and talked to my recruiter. And he said, don't worry about it. He said, but go ahead and take that uh, physical. So I had to go to the uh, Chicago for a physical for the Army, and I OA took the physical for the Air Force in uh, Indianapolis, and uh, so I thought, well, why do I have to? <laughs> but he said, go do it, and I went ahead and did it, and uh, so. But then I end up coming in the service December the tenth, nineteen sixty-nine, and uh, did that out of Indianapolis, and uh, we left out of Indianapolis. It was late at night, what I considered late at night. Of course, <laughs> at home it was late, late at night. It was like 10, 30, 11 o'clock, and we got into San Antonio at midnight. And they sit and uh, they hear them barking, as you would call it, you know, get out of the bus, line up, do this, do that. And, you know, all right, the, uh, they're open. I, I can't even, I'm kind of lost for words for uh, chow hall. Uh -huh. Chow hall's open. And so uh, we get in there and they said, heel to toe, heel to toe. Get in there and eat quick. All right, get done. We're going to take you to the barracks. And then you go to your barracks and they, they you get a bed and they says, okay, we're going to let you sleep in until 7 o'clock. I said, sleep in. Okay, all right. Well, the next morning it was 5 o'clock in the morning to get up. So you got to get up, fix your bed. And you didn't have those little tags hanging down. If you did, they'd take your bed and <laughs> toss it. Now fix it. <laughs> so it was quite a rude awakening, you know, not used to making your bed like that. <laughs> like that. And you had to bounce a quarter off, off the sheet, off the, the comforter and everything. So it was quite a, quite a different uh, uh, atmosphere for me to get used to. Do you think you adjusted well? I think I did pretty well considering it coming from a uh, town, that's such a small town and everything. I think it uh, made me a better person. And uh, if I had not gone in, I, I, I don't know why I would. I probably would have been still working on some, somebody's farm, but I think that the, that the education that I got out of the Air Force was far more than what I would have ever received in, in, in any, any branch of the, air, uh, of the military. I think you get more of a education uh, than what you would if you uh, just stick around where you've grown up, like in the farming community. I mean, you learn a lot when you're in the farming community, but you still, I think you learn more of the outside world, what's going on and everything. I don't know whether that's a proper uh, 
way to say that, but I, th I think it's, uh, uh, once you're used to just a small community and, and you're going out and, learn, and you're going into uh, different countries, you know, I think that it, you've learned more of, of uh, 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 a greater uh, world view. Yeah, the greater view, view you know, the, the, uh, the, the different, um, I can't even, I'm a loss for, it's okay. for, for words. Uh, uh, there are uh, more cultures. Co the different cultures, I yeah. thank you very much. There are different cultures and it's way different than what you would ever imagine in there. Uh, when I was at CCK, you know, I, I was always kind of a, not a person that wanted to go off base. I always wanted to stay on base and, and the guys that I was with, they talked me into going downtown to uh, um, North, uh, I think they call it Northeastern, I can't even think of the city's name right now. But uh, we went down there and, and you would meet some of the other guys from the base and, and the ditches, they call them Benjo ditches, I don't know where you guys knew that or not, but they were probably about six foot deep. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they had rains over there, those ditches would fill up. And so we'd walk down by one of those ditches and then you'd see uh, Mama Son washing her clothes down here, but then you see somebody else up here doing stuff that you shouldn't <laughs> go in the bathroom. Okay. And so it was quite uh, like, what the heck <laughs> is going on? And they had a, uh, a downtown portion there, you know, you'd, you'd stop and talk and, and you'd have a tendency to lean back. And I was leaning up against this one little glass thing in there and, and the guys were talk, talking and carrying on conversation. And they said, Terry, do you know what you're leaning up against? And I said, no. So I walked forward, turned around, and it was a snake market. A snake what? Market. Oh my. I'm scared to death of snakes. <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't care for snakes at all. And that's one guy was there, he said, five bucks, five bucks, five bucks for a snake. I said, no, <laughs> we ain't doing that. But the, somebody else got a snake for five dollars, and, and for him, he just took an ice pick and, <laughs> and then slipped <laughs> and cooked it right there. <laughs> and I go, no way, <laughs> I want to, let's go back to the base. I didn't care much for that culture, but it, I mean, it was interesting to, to, to see something like that. Okay, so um, you said CCK. Mm -hmm. Our listeners may not know what or where that is. It's uh, Taiwan, uh -huh. uh, and it's uh, Ching Chong Kong Air, Air Base, mm -hmm. okay? So it's, it's the, I think, the southernmost portion of Taiwan, I think, and uh, it's Beautiful land, beautiful area. I, I have pictures at home of it uh, where some of us got, there were about three of us got together and we paid a taxi cab driver $25, $27. And that was time, that was hard for us to come up with <laughs> that amount of money with all of us, but we came up with that and he stayed with us all day. He went up there and we took pictures. We paid for his, you know, his eats and everything. But uh, it was, uh, their, their, their landscape is just beautiful. Yeah. What year was that? That was probably 70, okay. uh, between 70 and 71, because that's uh, between 70 and 71 is when I spent 55 days in, in Vietnam. And uh, that, uh, that was another uh, milestone in my life. Uh, you know, you always, t uh, you'd hear back home like, why well, you go to Vietnam, you know, and you get yourself shot or, or something like that, and, and it wasn't that way because I wasn't at that point. I was, I was just a support vehicle for the, the airplanes uh, doing new, hydraulics or hydraulics uh, on the aircraft for uh, landing gear and uh, flight controls and anything else that had hydraulics going to it. So can we talk about that? Can can we uh, just back up a little and sure. talk about? Um, so you you went in, you had your first experience with Chow. Um, and it was a, a brand new awakening for you. Um, that was basic training? Yes. Okay, yes. and then did they pick your job or did you pick your job? Well, uh, <laughs> they, they, they gave me this test, this uh, color test, okay? And, uh, and that was in basic training. And you know, if you can see these numbers, and you know, one, two, three. And uh, so I didn't do well on that, but they said that, well, you can either go be an SP or you can be in hydraulics, are you colorblind? I go, not that I know of. All right, well, you can take hydraulics then, and because hydraulics is red. So I had to be able to tell the difference between red and whatever other color. 
so I so I spent uh, I went to school at uh, Chinook Air Force Base in uh, Champaign Urbana in Illinois okay and, and that was about 35 miles from home that's nice so I lucked out everybody said you, you <laughs> fall in a bag of crap and end up coming out smelling like a rose <laughs> I'm trying to keep this clean so <laughs> And uh, so this one guy said, boy, he said, I don't know how you did that. And I said, I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> so I spent 16, 16 weeks at Chanute for uh, training. And then uh, I got to go home for a little bit. And then uh, I went to uh, Philippines. And I started out on, on F-4s. And uh, as a young kid, 20 years old, I was so amazed at, uh, at uh, the aircraft and being that close to them. And when they first took me on the flight line, I started going close to where the, the F-4s were like taxiing down the, uh, the, the run, uh, not the runway, but the, going for the runway. And I was just walking towards that way and my, I think it was a staff sergeant, he grabbed me, he said, come here. <laughs> he, said, <laughs> he said, you need to come back this way. So it was quite, uh, you know, amazed at, at uh, the, uh, the technology and, and what was going on and so. What was your favorite plane? My favorite plane, I think I could say it's a 130. Um, it was a lot easier to get to, to the uh, filters and the, the different packs and, and everything. The F4, everything was around. You had to work around it. You couldn't see what you were doing. And, and, uh, but it's, uh, and it's the workhorse of the Air Force, or it used to be. I, I'm not too sure. It, I think they still use. I know they still use it, but I'm not too sure it works as hard as a, I think the the C-17 uh, takes more of the load than what the C-130. But uh, I definitely liked it. it. It was a lot better than than the others that I worked on. So, but uh, and then from there, I I think I did. Uh, it was like a turboprop, and I can't remember uh, the series. I think it was like uh, the 131s. Uh, they had two engines on it at, at Richard's Good Bar when I come back, and that, that was uh, that was different too. I had to get in behind the engine when the prop was turning, and uh, to bleed the system of hydraulics so that the door would operate. So that was kind of a scary situation. But uh, but the 130, that always you could always tell like you you I didn't even have to look up in the air. You could tell what that was a 130 taking off or coming in, and when it comes in over here at Wright State, uh, Wright Patterson, it. I know it's a 130 coming in. I, I can tell tell Sharon. I said, "That's a 130 coming in," and we call them the dirty herkies. <laughs> when um, when you were at your first duty station, which was the Philippines, mm -hmm. um, can you tell me about what an average day was like for you? Average day was kind of uh, more or less like a, a work day. You'd work a little bit, and I was also uh, um, trying to get my three level and. Uh, I had not got that when I, they curtailed me out of there and sent me to, to uh, CCK. Um, I'm a bad person for taking tests. I can study and I can study and study and then when it comes time to take that test, I, my mind just freezes or I draw a blank. Or, well, but this looks like a good answer. So, but when I got to CCK, I took it and, and I passed it and I had my five level. So, and that, and that was, gave you more responsibility uh, then a uh, three level. Three level always had to have somebody with it, and a five level you could go out and work. But then uh, um, uh, a seven level would come out and check your work and sign it off. You you could sign off the the write up, but like if if it was a uh, a red X a grounding item, then the seven level had to come out and, and sign it off. But you could sign off the the others underneath of it, the diagonals and the dashes. And so, but that was quite new. So, quite a responsibility. What was your favorite part of the Philippines, if you had any? Well, in the Philippines, uh, I, uh, I think my favorite part, I, I used to teach uh, Sunday school when I was over there. And uh, there was one kid that was there, and he was uh, quite, a, quite a handful. And between the other guy that was with me, and I can't, Dacio, Frank Dacio, I think is what, what his name was, and we called him the Tasmanian Devil. You called the kid that? Yeah, because uh -huh. he was a, he was a terror on, <laughs> not to his face. We didn't. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but uh, 
it was good, I, and I, I enjoyed that immensely, because I did that when I came back from overseas, but when I came back to, when I came to Richard's Control, or Wright Pad, so. So you got, were you already involved in, with religion prior to um, joining the military, or is that something that happened in the military? It happened when I was in the military, so. It, um, we had several different churches at home, uh, Presbyterian, uh, Methodist, uh, Church of Christ, uh, my mom always wanted me to go to church, but we never, I, we'd go sometimes, but sometimes we go, I, I'm, not, I'm not going to church. But that's, that's where I met my, the rock of my life, the love of my life, my rock, my wife. At church? Yeah. Okay. So, and that's a story in itself, too. All right, we'll get to that. Okay. Let's, let's we'll, uh, go back to the Philippines. You became a Sunday school teacher. So when you were teaching the children, um, these were Filipino children? Uh, I think or? that, uh, no, I th they were uh, dependents. Okay. They were dependents, they, they weren't Filipino. So this was all on base? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they, they had a chaplain on base there, that, uh, chapel that on base that, uh, that they, they would go to. So. And what, um, I want to say what branch of the religion? What? Oh, <laughs> uh, it, I think it was Protestant, I think it was. Uh, that I can remember. <laughs> That's been a couple of days ago, so it's kind of hard to remember. Okay. <laughs> Some okay. of this stuff. All right. so, um, how long were you in the Philippines? I was curtailed out of there, mm, I think it was less than probably 90 days, I think. They curtailed me out of there and sent me, I don't know why, how, or, uh, but I guess they needed more help in Taiwan than they did uh, uh, the Philippines. And uh, so I, and then from, you know, when I went to, Taiwan, uh, I spent the biggest part of my time in Taiwan. Um, it, it, and now at that time I, I went to Vietnam, but uh, I worked on uh, 130s when I got there, and that, it was the earlier models. And my training for trying to uh, change uh, uh, engine pumps and, and other stuff, uh, uh, stuff that I had not done that I needed to get off, send off, uh, signed off my 623, which was your training record at that time. Uh, was, uh, you know, sometimes you do it at night or when it's raining. Uh, there's one instance I remember, and I, and I don't remember my, my trainer at that time. Uh, we was trying to change a uh, engine pump, and the wing kept going up and down like this, and it made it hard to get in there and take the, the nuts off. And all we had to, you know, it wasn't that bad getting the lines off of it, but uh, having to come back around on this side and, and trying to get the nuts and everything that made the job a lot longer than what it was, and uh, uh, we was working very hard to get that done, but he, he got in trouble for taking so long, but he tried to explain to the, to the uh, higher ups that, hey, the wind was blowing it and was rocking like this, and, but uh, we finally got done, but they weren't happy with us taking, and I think part of me not, not knowing what to do took, took longer and everything, so. Got to have that on the job training. Yeah, so. But that was good. I, it was something that was good to learn. So I was a diesel mechanic. Mm, okay. In, in the army, though. Yeah. Well, that's all right. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so hey, I understand. We all work together. We all uh, work together. You know. The, yes. Um, on a Humvee, mm. the starter is yeah. so difficult. It has this really long bolt, and you have to hold it above your head. And the starter weighs forty pounds mm -hmm. by itself, just all by itself. And you've got to start that bolt, and you cannot see it. There's no mirror you can get in there. There's no. You just got to feel you, it. You got to feel it. And when you yes. get it started, you want to make sure you don't get it cross threaded uh, oh, when you start it. It's the if worst. you cross thread it, in 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 the story. H H E L L double. <laughs> yes. <laughs> With five, uh, yes, yep, the yep. hockey sticks, yep. all of it. All of it. It's just, uh, and and they and they look at you like, how? Yep. yep. How? You mean you tell me you could not feel? Yes. <laughs> yes. So I I understand yeah. maintenance. So it, it's uh, I I never did a whole lot of maintenance when I was at home. You know, my dad. I think he did a little bit of on the, on the, uh, lawnmowers and stuff like that. But I think the bigger stuff he took to to. Uh, a lot more uh, repair shop, uh, but uh, when I got into, into the Air Force, I mean, it was a different world, you know, learning the, the tools and, you know, open end, box in, uh, crescent wrench, uh, Ford wrench, uh, all this good stuff, you know, and, and uh, it was uh, quite eye-opening for me, so. 
you mentioned um, your fellow Sunday school teacher. Did you make any other uh, connections or friendships or relationships? I think it was, but I can't remember their names. There was uh, one guy, we, he was tall and slender, and, and uh, uh, I can't even remember where he was from, but we shared a room. Uh, I had pictures of, of our guard. There was a guard that used to go around and, and check on, on the rooms, make sure nobody was doing anything they weren't supposed to be doing. And is this in the Philippines? or uh, Philippines, okay. in the Philippines. And so when you got to um, CCK, mm -hmm. what was that flight like? That's a different, that, that's, uh, it was different. Um, that's when I met my, my th three other buddies uh, that um, we went to the airport, uh, to the uh, airport or the terminal. And uh, we had gotten to know each other at, pretty well and they said we got room for one person and he says if somebody would like to fly with us now he can and we all kind of said no I'm, I'll wait for the next flight well we each other we kind of saved our lives because that flight took off and ran into the side of a mountain mm -hmm. and so it's it, we talk about that you know uh, sometimes about how uh, fortunate we were that we made that decision not to fly on that plane and and to stick around stick with each other on that so it's it's amazing that you know I, a decision that you can that you make at that time uh, how short it can make your life or how long your life can be you know and it's it's something that you you think about the older you get you know what if I? What if I'd made that decision? If I'd made that decision to go, I would never met my wife, and it was, you know, and that's been the best thing that's ever happened to me in my life. So, but it's it's something that's, that you think about, on not on a regular basis, but you know, just times you start thinking about things, you know, how, and where you're at now, where you <laughs> where you were, <laughs> so. Your um, three buddies, are you still in contact with yes. them? Okay, yes. Okay, because you, you, okay. I got um, a buddy that lives in Franklin, just south of here. His, his name is Tom Bernard. And uh, he's, uh, and uh, my other one is in Missouri. Uh, he has cancer, and I, Sharon can help me out. What? Yeah. Uh, chronic leukemia. Chronic leukemia. And uh, so he's, he's going to the VA out there and, and they're, they're working with him on that. So, uh, and he's got a disability out of that. And my buddy in Franklin, um, he's got a disability. He, he's a diabetic and he's got, he just found out, I think last week that he has a cyst or a tumor on the back of his neck. And so they, I guess they're gonna have to go in and try to remove that. He was explaining to us with the procedure and I said, that don't even sound. <laughs> I just cringe to think what they, how they have to go in and get. And then my other buddy, he's from Pennsylvania, and his, first of all, my, my, my friend in Missouri, his name is Cliff Underwood, or Cliff Hampton, I'm sorry. And uh, he's, he was a, kind of like a, an Elvis impersonator. He just sounded just much, when he did sing, he sounded just like Elvis. And he looked a little bit like Elvis too, so we always called him Elvis. <laughs> so, but my buddy in Pennsylvania, his name is Charlie Dampman, and he's, uh, he's, uh, he had a business of hardware. He uh, has uh, fuel, but he has MS. And he comes over here three, four times a year to do uh, long, uh, volunteer work at the museum. And so he's uh, working on getting 1,000 hours in so he can get his name on the list of 1,000 uh, hours. What museum? Air Force Museum. Oh, okay. Yeah. So he goes over there and he and sometimes he spends all day. He might do it three or four days at a time. Uh, my heart goes off out to him for <laughs> for that's doing that. And it, and that takes him nine hours to drive from Pennsylvania over here. Wow. So that's something. He, he's amazing. He's he's got a lot of uh, uh, integrity. He's got a lot of uh, uh, get up and go to. Uh, he said that he knows that the MS is you know. Uh, working on him, so, but he wants to do it as mu much and as long as he can. So. Okay. so can you tell me about some of the things that you've, you four got into 
um, why you're <laughs> I'm in. I'm not sure I know. Okay. <laughs> no, oh. no. We, you know, we, we kind of stayed together, but we didn't really uh, get into it. Uh, we probably went to movies together or, or went to the snack bars, you know, and just kind of hung out and, and kind of uh, off site from that snack bar, you know, that they would uh, say, well, let's go get a soda, Terry. I go, okay. Well, I said, I don't think I'll get a soda. I said, well, I'll go with you. And uh, so they sat down and they started ordering and uh, I never knew pop was soda. Always called it pop, never called it soda, you know. And I said, well, I like that. I, no, I'll get me a pop. <laughs> and so they looked at me and gave me a strange look like, where are you from? <laughs> I said, I'm sorry, but it was always pop. It was, <laughs> it was never soda. <laughs> So, but that, that, that's what, you know, we go to the movies or, or uh, uh, we did take, I, I don't know what I told you, but we took a, uh, the, you know, the one trip to Sun Moon Lake in CCK and it was an all-day thing and it was, it was good. I mean, we, all three of us went there and it took pictures and, and enjoyed ourselves. So that's probably our biggest thing that we did together. I mean, we went to movies or went to the BX and looked around and everything. So. Did they have the same jobs as you? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So you guys were true battle buddies. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I made up a, a, a name tag that would have our names and each one of the name tags uh, that I sent to them, I had their name first and then everybody else's name. So. That's nice. Uh, I, uh, brothers. Uh, so I forget how I put that on there. You remember how I put that, Sharon? Uh -huh. But anyhow, I, I got a name tag that, you know, if we wear it, our name was first. And, and so. That's nice. That's but really nice. It's kind of cool. So um, you mentioned that you went to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Well, uh, it, it, it was better than what I thought it was going to be. I, I don't know what I can say better. It was different than what I thought it was going to be. Uh, you know, you think of Vietnam as, as uh, uh, being close uh, to gunfire and all that. You heard it in the background, but you but you never did see uh, any of the fighting or anything like that. Um, in Vietnam, I never lost, left the base, and I don't think any of us ever left the base. Uh, <laughs> we they had guards that were uh, Vietnam uh, the knees, we had, but they wore the same thing as the Viet Cong, so you never knew when you drove around the corner <laughs> whether the Viet Cong or Vietnamese. <laughs> uh, their dress was sim similar, I should say. Okay, so it was kind of like you go be driving in the expedite truck, and you go, "Well, I hope he's a, I hope he's a friendly." <laughs> so, but that, I mean, that was just kind of a thing uh, for us. I, and they had um, uh, little souvenir shops where you could buy stuff in Vietnam. So I, I can't remember what I bought there, but I mean, you'd buy little things that you could bring home. And so Taiwan I was where I bought some stuff, some Chinese stuff that I sent home. So. How'd your family feel about you being there? Well, you know, I, I'm not too sure. I think that they were very supportive of it, but I think they were kind of uh, concerned about me uh, leaving and, and uh, being naive as to the to the rest of the world because never left Rossville. I mean, it was a one one light one horse town, and you, and you go to Danville, and it was you know it uh, it was a little bit bigger, but it wasn't much bigger, you know, and it wasn't the 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 culture wasn't any different than what was in Rossville or Hoopston or any other place around. So, I I think they were supportive, but they were concerned about how I would. <laughs> take in the culture and everything so but they they were good so but okay you communicate a lot uh, with your sisters and parents and stuff my parents are, have passed away no, no, no I'm sorry then yes yes, yes. I would send letters and at that time they had a um, um, I can't even think of the name uh, the little recorders no, uh, no. they had a uh, we could call home free and it was like talking on the radio. And for the life of me, I can't think of the name of, the, of, of what it was. But you'd, they would connect you with home, and you had to explain to your mom, hey, say over. Well, I'd even forget, because I was so excited about talking back home. 
And, uh, but uh, that was free and you could do that, you know, maybe once a month or something like that. Uh, but most of the time it was like at letters. And uh, so, uh, but it, it was good. I, I, I got to communicate quite often with them. So, and my dad would accept, uh, collect calls. And, I, and it's, my dad didn't make that much money, so it was much appreciative that he would accept the calls. You know, talk for 10 minutes, and back then that was a lot of money. So, but I owe a lot to my dad. My dad gave me a lot of integrity, maybe. So. Do you think that what your dad taught you helped you in the military? I think so. I think so. I had an uncle of mine that was on my mom's side. He said, he knew I was going in. He said, volunteer for nothing. So I kind of remember that when they come up and started asking, would you want to do this? Well, it paid off a couple of times because some of the <laughs> stuff they wanted you to volunteer for was like, oh boy, am I glad I didn't volunteer to do that. But there's others that, you know, yeah, you volunteer to do it because they explain a little bit more. You know, yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> I, I get a day, I get a half day off. I don't have to do nothing. Okay. <laughs> so, but it was good. It was good. It was very, I had a very good education out of that. So when you say education, you mean like life lessons? Yeah, life lessons and, and, and book learning that, that I probably wouldn't have learned if I hadn't gone into the Air Force, you know. And, I, and that's every branch. I mean, you, you, you learn stuff that uh, if you come from a small town, you, don't, you, don't, you wouldn't have had that opportunity to learn that stuff. So. Was there, um, so you went to a few places that were quite different than, your, than Roswell? Roswell. Roswell. Yeah. Okay. So you went to the Philippines. Mm -hmm. You went to uh, Taiwan. Taiwan. You went to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Where did you go anywhere else? I came back to Richards Gabar, Missouri, Kansas okay. City, Missouri, and that was a little bit different. Uh, it was um, I don't know how to explain it. It was I was still living on base. Uh, I had uh, I had uh, a uh, Sears motor scooter, 50 horse that I had over there. And I had moved off base, I think, and uh, I used that to get, I didn't live that far from the base, but when it snowed, that was my only transportation to get to work. And it had to sit outside because I lived in an apartment at that time. And I would go out and start that. I'd be going down the road with my parka and my gloves on, going like that. <laughs> But it started every time. <laughs> I didn't have any trouble with it. So, but it's, uh, it was, uh, I, I learned some more uh, mechanics as far as the different aircraft. And I'm not too sure exactly what they were because it's been a couple of days since, since I've done that. Hey, so. That's okay. <laughs> 118s or 131s or something like that. I think it was something like that. So. Um, so you said you were in Vietnam for about 55 days, I think 55 so about six, days. six weeks or yeah, so? Yeah, something like that. And, uh, and that was at the time when I was pretty close, time to rotate to come back home. And I volunteered, I said, oh, I'll stay another 55 days. And that would have gave me about a week, a little over a week before rotating back home. And they said, no, we can't do that because if that 55 days would have made it like a PCS movement. Mm -hmm. And so they wouldn't allow me to do it. And he said, plus, a week is not enough time for you to process out. Well, I don't know. I always thought, yeah, I would have had plenty of time. So, but. And you say process out, you mean like process out of country or process out of the military? Process uh, back home, process that PCS back home. Okay. So, to, uh, to Richard Govar. So. Okay. Okay. How long did you serve? How many Four years? years. Four years? Mm -hmm. um, is there a particular um, memory that you have that's that you'd like to share? Well, it, uh, you know, it's it all kind of group with the letter. It's, uh, I think the most uh, thing that I really remember is, is that uh, when I came over here, it was SAC. Uh, uh, and it was, uh, uh, that was a different uh, environment totally, because SAC was always ready for uh, to go to war, and they always played their war games, you know, and it was like uh, the day before, they said, okay, we're having games tomorrow. Uh, 
uh, don't plan anything, don't plan on going home. You know, it's like an eight hour day that, that you work or eight or nine until you got relieved, I should say. And, uh, and you go, okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, appreciate that. I have plans. <laughs> So, but then, you know, sometimes they wouldn't last that long, but you'd see, uh, you'd see colonels really getting into this uh, acting or, or, you know, like it was a real thing, and, and it just made you kind of laugh a little bit. <laughs> but uh, it's, um, the, the 135s and the B-52s were, were uh, a special breed, the, the, especially the B-52s. I mean, they were so many um, different, uh, I guess you could say hazards on the B-52, uh, uh, working on the Bombay doors and going up and into the cockpit. There was always a um, uh, kind of initiation uh, when you started working on the B-52s. The, the crew chief would always have you come up and get in the cockpit, and there was a navigator seat that was right to the right. But when you get in, you know, you always have a tendency to bring your feet back like this. Well, when you did, the clamps would come around your legs. And you go, holy <laughs> crap. <laughs> and people be laughing at you, you know, like, oh, okay, you, you got it. <laughs> they got you. <laughs> so you always try to plan the, the next person to do it. But that, I think that was a, a thing that, like, scared the crap out of you. Because, you know, you, you hear so much of the, of the, uh, the seats uh, taking off and going. And, you, and uh, it was just like, oh, my God, is this... <laughs> <laughs> is this it? <laughs> but it wasn't. It was, they just undone, uh, uh, unclamped it and let you go. And just like that, you the whole rest of a week, more or less. So, but it, it was uh, very interesting. Uh, I think that, you know, after I did get off the but you know, there was a B-52 that uh, had uh, crash landed at, at Wright Pad. And uh, they had a... Uh, I think, I think that's a stab problem or something like that. And when he hit hard on the nose gear, the the uh, the cockpit broke off and slid down the down the runway, and the rest of the plane just blew up. But nobody got hurt. I, uh, nobody got died from it. Uh, uh, but I think there was a broken leg or something like that. I'm not too sure. But I'll take that over the alternative. Uh, yes, yeah. anytime. But I guess it, it was amazing that the, that had broke off like that. And, and they survived that. Were you there for that? Or? I was working civil service at that time. Oh. Okay. So I wouldn't, <laughs> it wasn't, wasn't me. <laughs> 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 Honest. <laughs> so. Okay. Um, after, yes ma'am. Oh, I was just wondering, um, sir, what brought you to Wright Pat then from Missouri? What brought me to Wright Pat? The Air Force brought me to Wright Pat. Um, and, um, I, I met my wife here, and I kind of, and I stayed here. Uh, I asked her. We got married in '73, October of '73, and uh, so I asked her. I said, "What do you want to do?" She says, "It's up to you." And so uh, a friend of mine at, at ch uh, church had told me. He says, "Go over here and talk t to these people over in the hydraulic shop." I said, oh, I, I, "Well, I didn't get over there as quickly as he thought I ought to get over." There. And he'd, he'd see him at church. He said, did you go talk to him yet? I go, no, I didn't. So I made a special effort to go over and talk to him. And uh, the, the shop chief at that time, I talked to him. And uh, he said, well, come back in a little bit. He says, uh, uh, I'll talk to you. And uh, so he came back and he hired me. And at that time, he got promoted to branch chief and another uh, shop chief came in. And, and so, but uh, I spent uh, 11 and a half years, I think, in the in the hydraulic shop. And, uh, As a I, civilian? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was uh, in charge of, uh, in shop repair, uh, the brakes, uh, some valves that come in, uh, the, the cylinders that come off your maintenance stands, your, your B1s, your B4s, and all that that would come in. And uh, so, and uh, I got real good at uh, doing, uh, checking out the uh, uh, engine pumps for the different aircraft. So it, it was quite neat. And then I left there and went, uh, um, I got a promotion to go to uh, uh, just be a general mechanic in the special programs of EMX. And I enjoyed that immensely. I got more responsibility and I got promoted uh, there, which was a lot, a lot better. I enjoyed that much more. So, 
it was good. And my, I think my mechanical background helped me to get that. So. Did you ever use your benefits to further your education or buy a home? I yes, on both of those. I I did uh, uh, start uh, an English class over, which I'm very careful about, about that. And uh, so I didn't uh, I didn't pass that, and so I got frustrated, and then I didn't come back to. It. But uh, I wish I'd somebody should have kicked me in the butt and told me to get back over there and get to it. And it was right here at Wright State. So, uh, but I did buy a house uh, with the VA loan. Uh, that was my first house, and then after that, started getting better uh, loans. You know that, that you get. Uh, uh, I think the first house that that we bought was uh, twenty one, about twenty one thousand dollars. We thought that was a lot of money back then. <laughs> you can't buy a car for twenty one thousand dollars. Not days. a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. So, but uh, you know, and then uh, uh, we went from there and bought it. Uh, bought the house we're in now. And uh, that was uh, 59000 And that's so, in Fairborn? And that's in Fairborn. So where you are a? City councilman. Okay. So, and I'm very proud of that. I, 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 everybody asks, uh, you know, why do you do it? I said, I like representing the people. People, a lot of people will, will tell me things that they won't tell other people. And I, and I, I feel that's a, that's a plus on my side, you know. and. Uh, I, I don't tell a lot of people, but I tell them, I said, you know, your best conversation with somebody is listening. Not talking, but listen what they got to say. And I think you, you learn more when you listen to what they got to say. And then you tell them, it, you say, well, you know, I'll do the best I can, and I'll, I'll get you an answer. It may not be the answer you want, but I will get you an answer. And I told them, I said, I'm not the only one making, an, uh, making uh, you know, Making a decision, I said. There's, there's six others. There's seven of us on that. So it's, it's, it's a group effort, and we don't, do, we don't argue. We got a TV that, that, that records us or we're videotaped. And I told him, I said, you don't see us arguing. We have work session where we do our arguing or debating. It might be a better word. So it's, uh, uh, I like it. I enjoy it, and I, I'm hoping that uh, you know in another four years I can. Represent them some more. So it's it, it's uh, it's a g it's a good team I'm working with. I mean, the, everybody that I'm with right now in in the city uh, employees are just fantastic. They're friendly and, and they're easy going, and and uh, I just enjoy them. Did any particular event take place that inspired you to run for office? Well, <laughs> the wife and I we used to go to uh, to all the council meetings that they had, and they happened every first and third uh, Mondays of the month, and we would sit back in the back and, and listen to them and everything, and then I got approached from somebody asking me if I'd thought about running, and I said, no, I hadn't really thought about it, and uh, so uh, I got asked two or three times, and then we, we decided we'd, we'd look, that I would attempt it, and, and my wife was my, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for, Sharon? Support system. Yes, yeah, she was my support mm -hmm. system. She's the one that uh, my financier and uh, still can't even think of. I'm the also, wife. your campaign manager. Campaign manager. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Couldn't think of that. That's, I'm drawing blanks here today. So, but uh, uh, we're we getting towards the end. November the fifth supposed to be the election. On this. So I'm hoping that uh, everybody likes me enough. Got a lot of people asking for my yard sign. So. <laughs> I'm hope I'm hoping that's a plus for for uh, doing it. And, I'm, and I got um, door hangers, you know, for your pamphlets and everything. So, going to be doing that to, tomorrow. Uh, a bunch of us are getting together and going to put them together and take them out and hang them on the door. So, how did that feel the first time that your photo was on a political flyer or advertisement? It was quite different. It was kind of like this right here. You know, you look at that and you go, wow. <laughs> Everybody's going to see this now. <laughs> Maybe they're going to use it for a dartboard or whatever. But it, it's, you know, uh, uh, to have, have people that support you and, and, and want, you to, want you to win is so uh, humbling. You know, that they think enough of you that, 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 you, can, that you can represent them. 
So uh, that's and that's and that's great. It's just uh, you know, yeah. I guess I can say I've been very blessed. Uh, I'm finding my wife here, and I and I, I'll tell you that right here real quick there. But it, she uh, she's been my rock. She's been the love of my life, and and she just she's been there for me. You know, and it's just been uh, I've been a great life. I've been blessed for the last 46 years of my life. So and I have no remorse, no 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 qualms about what what happened. We've 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 been together for that long. Well, we've been together 47 years. So. <laughs> so how did you meet her? It was kind of funny. When I first came here, I, I was looking for a church. I was looking for a Baptist church. And uh, so I started driving down Broad Street, and I stopped at this first gas station. I asked the guy, I says, hey, where's the Baptist church? I don't know. He said, go on down to this next gas station. This guy will tell you. So I went to the gas station. He says, yeah, he said, there's a gas station. Up, there's a Baptist church up here on the, on the high view. I said, all right. So I went up there and looked at it and seen what time they had their services and everything. So I started going to that, and, and that was in August. And uh, my pastor came up to me one day and he says, um, you got a girlfriend? I said, well, I said, I'm dating. I said, but I said, nobody special. He said, well, I got this little girl I want you to meet. Okay, well, sounds good. So uh, anyhow, I kept going. I would go to Sunday morning. I'd go to Sunday evening. I'd go to Wednesday. And all the church service just to, to meet my wife to be, <laughs> and uh, so it came up uh, about December, December the first I think or something, uh, and uh, it was on a Sunday night, and the pastor said she's here, she said stand right over here, I said, all right, so I went over stood over there, and you and you know how uh, Baptist church uh, that uh, preacher will stand there and shake hands with everybody that come in, and uh, so uh, her and mom and dad with her and he said here she is and introduced me to Sharon and I said can I have your telephone number so she gave me her telephone number so Monday night I called her up and asked her for a date so not really knowing the area very well I uh, uh, searched all week for her address and it's right and she told me it was right behind the church well it wasn't registering with me where, exactly where it was at so I found it. I think it was only either on Wednesday night or Thursday night. I said, Whew, at, least I <laughs> at least I know where to go. <laughs> and uh, so uh, uh, it was kind of snowy. And I, I pulled up. And uh, uh, their house is, what's it called now, Sharon? On 46 Circle Drive? What? Cape Cod, I can't think of and uh, had a little porch, probably not much wider than something like this, and had two steps to it. And the doorbell says not, because it didn't work. So I knocked on the door, and her dad comes to the door, and uh, I says, uh, is Sharon here? And he goes, Sharon who? I was afraid to say her last name, because her last name was Crummy. C R U M M I E. I was afraid to say it. I was afraid I was going to mispronounce it. And I stepped back and my mouth dropped open. And her dad was a jokester. And he started laughing. And he said, Yeah, she's here. <laughs> and her mom worked night shift over at the base that time. And he called her up and told her, He said, No, you didn't do that to him. He said, Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> so it was on after that. So, but. Uh, our our first date, we went bowling, and we went to Burger Chef to eat. So that was our first date. So Burger Chef no longer around, but bowling obviously still over here. So, but that that was our that was first date. And it was so so uh, uh, neat. And I think uh, Sharon told me she says, "Well, I think my mom had something a little bit to do with that getting with the pastor." <laughs> I said, "That's a good possibility. <laughs> you never know what." <laughs> what's going on but uh, so it was and that was the, probably the best thing best phone call I ever made fantastic so, so you met her and then you just instantly asked for her phone number yeah <laughs> you got a lot of courage real quick <laughs> oh, <huh>? yeah. <laughs> so yeah we made it uh, we dated from uh, 
uh, from that December till uh, the next year, and I think I popped the question in in June. <laughs> she swears up and down she didn't do this, but I asked her. I said, "Would you marry me?" And I saw it, swear it was 30 minutes later <laughs> before she answered and said yes. She said, "No, I don't think it was." <laughs> I'd seen like that. I guess I was just so <laughs> uh, wanting, uh, wanting her to say yes. But uh, uh, and then we went out and uh, we went up to Rogers up uh, at the Springfield Mall and ordered her ring, and then. Uh, I think it was a week or two later, and then she put it on, and her sister, older sister, was at the house, and she didn't say anything. She just kind of went, went like that, and her sister recognized her having the done ring on. So, and but then we planned the, the wedding. We got married October the 20th, 1973. It's been a wonderful journey. Yeah, it's been a great journey. Are you a part of any veterans organizations? Yes, I'm part of the Fairborn Veterans Memorial. That is uh, veterans, military veterans memorial in Fairborn. And uh, we're working to get money so that we can build the memorial. Uh, I don't know where you know about the uh, central uh, school there on, on Central in Fairborn. We're gonna be putting a, uh, a memorial up there and it's gonna have all three uh, branches and everything and there you can buy blocks uh, to put uh, put down there for a loved one or yourself and uh, there's different prices uh, different size blocks and everything uh, that um, uh, you can buy uh, so uh, don't ask me what the prices are because I can't remember <laughs> what they are but uh, uh, so uh, and I and I belong to the downtown betterment uh, committee for Fairborn uh, so I work with that, and I also work with um, uh, the Halloween parade in Fairborn. I help them out with the parade. Uh, Sharon and I do judging on the different classes. You know, you got from baby up to adults. You know, uh, so and that and that's and that's a lot of fun. And I play Santa Claus for Fairborn City. So each year when they have the the holiday. They call it the holiday parade. Some people don't like the Christmas parade, so but uh, uh, the holiday parade and uh, uh, the kids just come sit on my lap and tell me what they're wanting for Christmas. And I said, okay, we'll see what we can do. I'll see if I can find it on the shelf for you. So, do they ask you for things that you have no idea about? Oh at? yes, I'll I'll look at some. Uh, they got elves that are standing around, and I look. I'm like. <laughs> and someone's like, uh, tell me what it is. And I go, oh, okay. Yeah, I think I've seen that on this. <laughs> so, but you know, and, and it's kind of funny that, that, that some of them uh, will ask for toys, they'll ask for clothes, or shoes, or books, or uh, a job for the, for, the, for the mother or dad. And I think that's kind of, it's, it just kind of brings a tear to your eye. That, so, but it's it, it's good. I I think probably the, la the last one I, I think I I think over 300 kids sit on my lap. So plus, because uh, and we go down and, and like to treat at the same time. At, at, after I spend about an hour and a half with the kids, and then there's about probably about another 50 or so kids that will come and sit on my lap. Do you think serving as the role in, of Santa Claus gives you more insight into um, the needs of your community then? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, you know, you, you, you hear about all that stuff and it's just like, uh, what, can, what can we do to try to uh, lighten the load or, or help people? And sometimes it's not that we, we don't want to, it's just that we don't have the monies to do that with all the projects that, that's going on. And it's, you know, you have restrictions on how you can spend your money. So it's just kind of hard to, to hear that and not knowing that you, you don't, don't have the monies to help them with it. Can you tell me about Honor Flight? Honor Flight, wow. That's, like I told my wife, that was probably the second best date in my life. My first one was marrying her. Uh, it was on May the 19th of last year. And uh, the lady that uh, kept telling me about it was Terry Lynn Perkins. She, she has a art studio in Fairborn on Main Street. 
And uh, she said, go ahead and apply for it. Well, okay, well, I, I'll go ahead. And well, I'd see her again. She says, have you applied for it? I said, no, I haven't done it. So I, I went ahead and filled it out and sent it in. And it was about a year later. And they called me up and said, would you be available on May the 19th? I go, yeah, I guess I will be. And so I went down and told her about it, and she said, can I be your guardian? I go, yes, you sure can. Because she'd done it a couple times before. And I said, yes. And I said, I'd, I'd be quite honored to have you as my, my guardian, because she knew where she was going. She knew what things had to be seen and everything like that. And uh, so it and, uh, left the house at 3.30 that morning, got home about midnight, wasn't it, Sharon? About midnight. That, and uh, it was kind of funny that uh, uh, you didn't have to pay for anything. I mean, you didn't pay for the flight or anything. You just, you went there and you got to, to go to all the memorials, you know, and, and it was uh, quite a, uh, a different day to, to see all the memorials that, you know, if you went there on your own, you'd never be able to see them, you know, and they, it, it was uh, qu quite a moving where you see the, the statues of World War II and, and they, how lifelike they look, you know, and all the writings. I mean, it, it, probably if you wanted to read everything in, in all the worlds, you wouldn't, you'd have to spend a month to read them all. But it was, it was quite neat. Uh, you felt like a, um, felt like royalty, if I could say that. Uh, they had four buses, and, it, and I guess I ought to back up a little bit. When you got to Washington, they had people there meeting you there, clapping and thanking you. And I thought, wow, how, I mean, it was seven o'clock in the morning, you know, or eight o'clock in the morning, and they were up at one, in Washington doing it. And, I, and I, I won't say that's early, but I mean, it's just something that surprises you that the fact that they, that they are, were there doing that. And uh, so it kind of, you know, you, you start to get the, wow, these people are fantastic, you know, uh, coming here and doing that on their own time and doing this. And uh, uh, the guardians, that they, they pay their own way. And it's $400 a trip. And I think that's just fantastic that they give up their time from their families and, and, and want to help us out. You know, so, it's, and to come back, and to come back home from, from Washington after that long day, you know, after you, they serve you lunch and they give you uh, your supper. They call it dinner, but I call it supper. I don't care. <laughs> I brought up the supper. It, it, you know, and when you're on, when you're, when you're tired and you're ready to come back home, it's just like, okay, I'm ready. Come on, let's go. <laughs> and you gotta wait for, you know, you gotta wait for when the plane's supposed to take off and everything. But, and to come back and that late at night, and you have people that are uh, there cheering you on, you know, uh, active military, retirees, uh, people that have done it before, you know, and, and it was so neat that when, uh, when I came down, some of the people were getting off from, the, from, the, from their flights, and they were standing there, and, some, and they were clapping, they had nothing to do with it, but they were told that it was on a flight, and they were clapping and cheering and thanking for, for your service, which was a lot different from the time when you come back. So can you tell me about that? Coming back was, was uh, very sad. Uh, I was very proud of my uniform, and when I come back, I wanted to uh, put on my blues, and we was going to go to Hoofston, which was seven miles away. And I was walking down the sidewalk, and it was just like nobody wanted to talk to you. It was like you had leprosy or something, or whatever you want to call it. It just, you felt alone. And so all you wanted to do is go home and take your uniform off because of the way the people acted. But I, and I was very proud of my uniform. When I put my uniform on, I felt very good. I felt that I was doing something for my country. So it's, uh, for them to, to do that, I mean, we took orders. You know, and we was trying to, to keep our our country free, and that's just people just didn't only had one person 
and my city to welcome me back, and that was my barber. Terribly sorry to hear that. Yeah, and my family did too, but I mean, the, other than my family, the, so, but that was the... I, sincer I sincerely hope that Honor Flight helped make up for that. Oh, it did, it did. I've, I've gone a couple times to, to cheer them when they come back, you know. I get busy and I forget that, that they're coming back on a Saturday or, uh, and it's just uh, you know, uh, the, the tears that, that some of the, the veterans have when they come back in is, it's so real, so, you know, it's, it's hard to explain. And I, 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 another thing that, you know, when you're on a plane, you're coming back and you're probably about, oh, I don't know, maybe half an hour or 45 minutes out. and and they'll, they'll get up in the middle of the aisle and they'll say, what's the one thing that you want, want to hear when you're overseas? And I said, when do I go home? They go, no, mail call. <laughs> and, I, and so they, they have people that, you know, that have uh, written letters to you, and it's people that don't even know you, you know, and, and, but your, your, your spouse has gotten a hold of some of the people to, to write your letters, you know, that, telling you thank you. And so they pass those out on the plane? Yeah. Oh, yeah, in, a, in like a brown envelope or, you know, so it was, and little kids, and it was quite unique, quite a very memorial day. It's a very thoughtful gesture. Yes, that's very good. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have been part of it, so. We're happy for you. Well, thank you, appreciate that. Okay, so any other uh, organizations that you're a part of? Not that those weren't awesome. Yeah, um, I'm just part of the downtown Benham, uh for for Fairborn, uh, which works closely with the chamber in Fairborn, and uh, and I like that because uh, you know you get a little bit of uh, what people are, are looking for and want to do and, and trying to uh, always trying to make. Um, a better, I won't, I don't know, as better or uh, make it so that people want to come back to Fairborn. And it's, and it's, it's hard because people want things done like that. And it, it can't happen like that. You gotta wait for the, the money's coming for grants and, and, the, and, the, and the budget to be passed and everything. So it's just, it's, it's good. It, it gets frustrating at that time when people ask you, why is it taking so long? Or why haven't you got this done? But it's it's great. It's good. I I enjoy what I'm doing, or I wouldn't be re running again. Okay. Um, what are some life lessons that you've learned from your military service? <laughs> um, when you do a job, do it right the first time. If you can't do it right the first time, don't do it at all. You know, have a little respect for the people you're working with. Um, you know, if if you got time, if you see somebody's in need, help them. You know, it's not always. It's sometimes it's not always a um, a physical thing. It might be you know a, a spiritual thing that they might just want you to listen to what they got to say. You know, and I think that helped out a whole lot just to listen to what people had to say. So, and I enjoy that sometimes. It, it can, uh, it brings you back down to earth. When you think you're up here, they can bring you right back down where you need to be, where you need to be thinking about others than yourself, so. Is there anything you feel like we haven't discussed or that needs to be added to this interview? Not right now, I don't think so. I think you've done a great job. You let me. I don't think I've ever talked this long before in my whole life, but it's, it's, I enjoy it. I, it, it, it. It's been, thank you very much, I appreciate it. So, Mr. Dan Kip, you need to get over there, you need to get it done, so when I get home, I'll, talk, I'll tell Dan, all right, Dan, I got it done. <laughs> Wonderful. I didn't know if there were any children that would feel left out, if not mentioned. We don't have no children. Okay. Uh, okay. We've, uh, we've always had um, dogs. Uh, when we first got married, about a year after we was married, we, Sharon always wanted a dachshund, and we got a dachshund, and that dog lasted for 17 years, wasn't it, Sharon? And uh, 
So then we've always had a dachshund or we've had a Sheltie or we've had a golden retriever or, you know, and we lost two puppies last year. And uh, one had COPD and the other one, she just, uh, she had a mass on her chest. And uh, so one passed away one month and one month, the next one went the next month. I think she had a little bit of love for the one that we lost. And uh, so, but we have another dog, our uh, paper girl for the Fairbairn Herald. She knew that we had lost the dogs and she kept, I don't know whether harping is the right word, but she kept talking about this one dog. And I said, no, I said, no, we don't want another dog. She said, oh, you need another dog. Well, and then she started bringing pictures, showing them on, on, her, on her phone. And uh, so uh, we thought about it, thought about it. And then one day we sat in there and, and uh, talking about it. And I said, give her a call. So she brought the dog over. And he's a part chihuahua, part pug, part beagle. Sweetest little thing, but he's a big friggin' challenge. <laughs> he's like having a kid at our age. He's like, <laughs> go to bed. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's it's good to have him. I mean, he's he he likes to ride. He likes to go with us. He likes to go for walks. So, uh, but that's good. And I, I, like I said, the last. 47 years of my life has changed so much being with Sharon that she's been my rock. She's been the person that's kept me straight, kept me uh, motivated, kept me uh, going the right direction. She's, I can't say enough about her. Well, thank you, Sharon. So, <laughs> and I'm not just saying that because she's here. She is, she's my, she's my rock. She's, I don't know where I'd be with her if she wasn't my wife. That's beautiful. We're happy you're here today. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. What message would you like to leave for future generations that will view or hear this interview? I, I would say that, you know, if, if, you, get a, if you have a chance and, and uh, you, can, you would like to serve in the military, I think it would be a, a very um, rewarding. Uh, there are so many different programs that they have in the, in the, in the military. Uh, feels now that that you can do that uh, a lot of them that you know you can you can take these the, the schooling and it and after you get out or if you retire from you can you still use that to to uh, uh, maybe work as a contractor you know uh, contractors are always looking for a prior military with people depending on what their background is and uh, and it can uh, uh, definitely change their whole way of of, of life. Uh, you know, the, the decision to make to go into the military. Uh, if they come from a, a small town like I did, I, it would be definitely an eye opener. Uh, it wouldn't be cornfields, it wouldn't be bean fields. <laughs> it would be a, a whole different uh, culture to look at. And I think it would probably be a positive uh, attitude for them to, to do it, be a positive way to go. Well, we agree. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so. That concludes our interview with Terry Burkett. Thank you for your time today and for your military service. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.